best. Okay. So A is for when they're not breathing, not pul no pulse. B is they have a pulse and they are breathing. Now box C, we do not do anything with that. That's about nutrition. The hospital will go ahead and take care of that. But this is where our signatures come into play. So required signature, let me point out, and you can see the required boxes. This has to have a signature here by the patient or the POA. This has to have a signature, and that's the witness. And then down here, the attending physician's name printed, attending physician's name signature, and the date. So you have to have all five of those for this form to be valid. Now, it used to be in the past that these are only good for one year, but we know patients don't always have these updated. Best thing again, it's been four years, the patient has this form, call medical control and say, listen, I have this, this pulse form, it's been four years, can I honor it? More than likely, they're going to probably allow it. Anybody have any questions on the front side of the form? I have a question. Yes, sir. Go back to A. Go back to A. Okay. So, first box, if you check that, then you have to check something under B. Yeah, because this is, box A is when you, no pulse, no breathing. Box B, if you still have a pulse, you're still breathing, kind of that circle in the drain thing without sounding disrespectful. You know, they're getting ready to pass out, but they still have a pulse. But it, I mean, it's understood whether you have one of these forms or not. If, if you go down, if you, if you want the, the resuscitation and CPR, that's like not having a form at all. I mean, that's how we're going to respond to everything. So yeah. what's the point of this? That's a really good question. Yeah, and unfortunately, I think there right now there's only four or five states in the United States, Wisconsin being one of them that has not jumped on board with this form, but everybody else has. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, to me, it's, I don't have time when someone is sitting there and I need to be doing something for that patient. They're still alive, heart rate's really low. Um, their airway, they've got low set, oxygen stats, and now I've got to read this form and say, can I innovate them? They don't, they want medications for comfort, but they don't want medications for raising their pressures. I can pay some here, but I can't pay some there. I mean, that's why I just kind of always say, refer back to medical control and let them know they've got full treatment, selective treatment or comfort measures checked, and they'll let you know what they need to do. Now, on the back side of the form, the back side of the form is just strictly for information only. Okay. Um, again, it's just the information of the patient. They'll also put down if they have advanced directives, um, who their power of attorney is, do they have a living will, um, do they have a mental health treatment preference, who their doctor, and this is here, who put this together for them, who the name of the doctor, because not all doctors will put this together. Um, sometimes the nurses and stuff will prepare this and then they will have the doctor sign it. So here's kind of the directions. Um, completing the pulse, do not resuscitate a form. Um, anytime someone writes void or maybe on the front side, when they filled it out, they wanted CPR done. But now it's been a couple of years, they decide not to, so they pull the form out of their safe, they scratch out, um, do CPR, and they check do not do CPR, that form is null and void. Anytime there's any change made to that form, a new form has to be made. Um, a patient with a capacity can void or revoke this form or request alternative treatment. So if the patient too is of sound mind, they can go ahead and make any changes. Changing, modifying, or revising the pulse form requires the completion of a brand new form. Um, or writing void across it can void everything. These are the people, the priority, according to the surrogate um, act, of the people that can go ahead and um, the order of priority. So a patient's guardian, a person, the spouse, adult child, parent, adult sibling, and so on that kind of fall in order for decision making if they don't have someone listed, if they don't have an actual POA. So, 
Yes, a POA can go ahead and make this null and void. They can make it changed. You know, some of the things that we sometimes see in the field, you get out there and mom is on the floor, pulses and not breathing. And you get out there, son hands you the form, the DNR form, but the daughter is not on board with it. She's really upset. She says, save my mom. Do everything you can. I don't care that she has that form. Our recommendation to you is at this point in time, you can start basic CPR, but talk to her. Have someone speak with her. I know this is sometimes very hard for people, but you know, tell her, this is what your mom wanted. This is, let's honor her wishes. Most of the time, if you put it back on you, and you're the one that's kind of making the decision and kind of you know, letting her know it's OK to honor this form, um, they go right on board with it. But in case for some reason that this form ends up being overturned, at least basic CPR was started. Contact medical control. Let them know that, yes, this form's in place, but it's been voided. We're going to be transporting. Now, if you do start CPR on these patients, and the sister goes, yeah, all right, I understand. We'll honor mom's wishes. Because you have that form, you can stop CPR at that point in time. You don't have to ask permission to stop CPR because you've got that form. Again, I know they did an in-service a couple years ago in September. Um, there's just been a lot of questions on it as of late. So. Um, a patient who is suspected to be known pregnant, a DNR cannot be honored. <clears throat> so if, if you see a pregnant woman, she has a DNR for whatever reason, maybe she filled it out before she got pregnant, the DNR cannot be honored. If you suspect abuse from the caregiver or a family member or any type of abuse either, and they have a DNR form, we do not honor that DNR. We provide the patient with complete care and we transport them to the hospital. So. Currently, right now, if a patient comes in from another state and they have an out-of-state DNR, we do have to contact medical control to make sure that we can honor that DNR form. Okay? Um, just, it's a very simple, more than likely, medical control will allow that. Does anybody have any questions on this pulse form? Okay. Now hospice care. This even gets a little bit more confusing because hospice patients don't have to have DNRs or have the actual DNR form. Um, if you arrive on scene and a patient's a hospice patient, they've called you for whatever reason, we'll get into that in a minute, but if they go ahead and they arrive on scene and you say, well, do they have a DNR? Well, they're hospice. They should, when they sign up for hospice, there's a form that they get filled out. And it should be in their paperwork right, <coughs> right at their home. They can, you use that form as the DNR form. You can say they are a hospice patient. So, um... It's very difficult. The reason you guys get called for hospice is because the family kind of freaks out at that point in time. Um, they don't know how to handle it. The patient's uncomfortable, or they think the patient's uncomfortable. Um, they get scared. Now, the issue with hospice is, hospice is a great organization. It not only you know, helps care for the family members and the patient, it does spiritual, emotional, medical care for them, comfort care which is very, you know, is good for the whole experience for the most part. Now, um, if you go to these homes and someone says, well, I want you to take my mom into the ER, transporting a family member, or transporting a hospice patient to the hospital for what they're in hospice for can get them pulled out of hospice. This is explained to the family members, this is explained to the patients, but they don't always remember that. And because hospice is such a great organization, please try and remind your, your patients, family members of that. You know, we'll be happy to go ahead and take your mom into the ER, but if we do, she may end up being removed from hospice. 
the dying process a lot of times is not an easy process to work. Yes, some people just slip, or slip off to sleep, and that's fine. Some people, though, it's those last couple breaths, they can seem like they're in a lot of pain, and that's generally when people will go ahead and give us a call. Now, in order to be put into hospice, they usually state that someone has less than six months to live. And Medicare will renew hospice up to two additional times. So a patient will have 18 months where technically they can be on hospice if they don't pass on during that time. After 18 months, they do go ahead and remove them from hospice. Um, they go through reevaluation processes and they can ultimately end up back on hospice again. But um, they have to do a good reassessment at that point. Hospice patients often require transport via an um, ambulance to home or inpatient hospice facilities. Yeah, we'll see people or ambulances taking people all over the United States back home um, to enter hospice. The thing about it is, is when they do, they don't go into hospice generally until they're home. So then you would need that DNR form. Until that hospice paperwork is signed, you do need a DNR form. And I know you guys are not generally the ones that are doing the inner facility changes. Um, when there's a sudden decline or change in the patient's conditions, the patients or the family, they're not sure how to handle it, so they call 911. One of the things you can do on scene is, well, have you called your hospice nurse today? Is the hospice nurse able to come over? Because some of them are. Um, a lot of them will be given atropine drops to help dry up some of the secretions in the mouth, especially from those that are dying of lung cancer. They get that almost like they sound like they're they're drowning in their own uh, fluids. Also, they have liquid morphine, which is very common. Just know that some of these patients can be on up to 3,000 milligrams of morphine over a 24-hour period. Very high doses of morphine <coughs> because they've been on morphine for a long period of time due to probably some type of cancer. Um, If a patient, like I said, is being transported for an unrelated problem, um, maybe they have prostate, pro uh, prostate cancer, and now they develop the flu, and they're dehydrated, they're unable to eat or drink because they're throwing up quite a bit, um, and they got flu-like and they need to be transported. That generally is okay. Um, they don't pull patients off a of hospice for that, but if, it's re if they relate it any way back to the cancer or the reason they're on hospice, then they'll more than likely remove them from hospice. So. Anybody have any questions on the hospice? Just know that, again, some of them will not have DNR forms, and you can use the hospice form, their entry paperwork, as your DNR form. All right, last section here are elderly abuse. As we said before, anybody over the age of 65 is considered to be a geriatric, a senior, um, an elder. You are a mandatory reporter, so you do need to go ahead and report possible elderly abuse, just like child abuse, um, spousal abuse, gunshot wounds, dog bites, things like that. When we talk about elderly abuse, it could be um, not only the physical damage you might cause to someone, but simple neglect, emotional, verbal abuse can also fall underneath this category. We usually see the people that are um, the victims of elderly abuse being abused by their caregiver or a family member. And like I said, it doesn't have to be actual physical abuse. It could be that grandma came to live with you and so now you put her in your room and you kind of forget about her, you give her food every so often, but you ignore her, you don't um, interact, you neglect her. Um, you know, you don't shower or bathe her, and she starts to develop sh um, some types of sores. So we see other types of elderly harm included um, financially. Well, I'll have grandma come live with me because she's loaded, and I can pop her up in a back room, you know, and just feed her every so often and leave it at that. We see that sometimes, the neglect or even abandonment. Family members don't go visit, they don't care for her, they don't make sure that they get the home health care. So, and the abusers can be anybody that is in a relationship with the victim. Most of the time it is the family members. They have, and the worst part about it is these, these patients are dependent on those people to survive. They need help getting cleaned up. They need help getting their food. They need help with someone to pay their bills. 
where elderly abuse becomes um, kind of a problem because they see a lot of our elders, you know, they got dementia, they don't know the story straight, they think this is what's going on. And so these can be very difficult investigations to go ahead and do. You guys, if you suspect not only the um, abuse, but in your assessment, remember I told you before I was talking about the bruises on the arms, the skin tears, the cubitus ulcers. Those are important to document in your EMS report so that if something does happen, someone is being abused, they can go back and say, yeah, when she was transported here, she had these bruises. So things that complicated, like I said, dementia or impairment, patients who are on multiple medications. Some of these medications can cause um, cognitive problems. Make sure you're documenting only things that are factual. Your opinion here doesn't matter. Put down strictly what you see. The house was a disaster. There was rotting food on the counter. There was cat feces all over. The patient was in soiled garments. It smelled like urine in the house. Those, that type of information is going to be very helpful and beneficial in your report. You see different bruises with different stages of healing. So this is our protocol. And like I said, we define it with the age of 60. Abuse is defined as any physical injury, sexual abuse, mental injury inflicted on a person. Neglect is the failure to provide adequate medical or personal care or maintenance. Failure which results in physical or mental injury to the person or in the deterioration of a person's physical or mental condition. So this is actually pretty broad. Now, this phone number is correct. I think the last protocol book, it went to the Attorney General's office. Um, <coughs> when we rewrote the protocol book, we do have the correct number in there now. Not only do you guys go ahead and report it to the nurse or the doctor when you drop the patient off, but please make sure you're, you're giving this number a call. Now, it's not like your pediatric one where you have to go ahead and turn in a written report within 48 hours. If they are requesting a report, my recommendation is you follow your department's policy as far as releasing your EMS run review. I don't know what your policy is here, so refer to um, whoever handles that. But don't just automatically give them a report, okay? Because sometimes they need to be subpoenaed. Sometimes um, there's a different policy or way that they'll go ahead and do it. Anybody have any questions on elderly abuse? Yeah. So we have a quick 10 question quiz. He's going to go ahead and hand them out. One per person. I thought maybe we'd have a couple. Oh, I was going to say. Now you hand out someone.